Thank you, Cam. Uh, good afternoon. This is Steve Conklin, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governance with our special meeting for May 3rd, 2023. Uh, call this meeting to order. And uh, do we do it? We do it a roll call on this, correct? Yes. And so I'll turn it over to Cam for the roll call. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, Adams, count, Adams County, Steve Odoricio. I'm present. Thank you. Um, Arapahoe County, Jeff Baker. Present. Thank you. Uh, Boulder County, Claire Levy. Present. Thank you. Uh, City and County of Broomfield, Austin Ward. Present. Thank you. Uh, Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock. Uh, how about Clear Creek uh, County, George Marlin? Okay. Uh, City and County of Denver, uh, Nicholas Williams. Here. Thank you. Uh, Douglas County, George Teal. Here. Thank you. Um, Gilpin County, Mary Morness. Okay. Uh, Jefferson County, Tracy Kraft Tharp. Yes. Thank you. Uh, City of Arvada, Lisa Smith. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, City of Aurora, Dustin Zavonik. Okay. Uh, how about Juan Marcano? Okay. Uh, City of uh, Town of Bennett, Larry Bidham. Royce Pindle, Town of Bennett. Okay, City of Blackhawk, David Spellman. City of Boulder, Nicole Spear. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Bomar, Margo Ramsden. Okay, uh, City of Brighton, Jan Pulowski. Okay, uh, City of Castle Pines, Deborah Mulvey. Mulvey. Okay, uh, Roger Hudson. Uh, City of Castle Rock, Tim Dietz. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Centennial, Tammy Maher. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of uh, Central, uh, Todd Williams. No, okay. Uh, City of Cherry Hills Village, Randy Wheel. Here, glad to be here. Yep. Glad to have you. Uh, City of Commerce City, Craig Hurst. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Donco, uh, Catherine Whitman. Okay. Uh, City of Edgewater, Steve Conklin. Here, good evening. Good evening. Uh, City of Inglewood, Othaniel Sierra. Uh, Cheryl Wink, City of Inglewood. Uh, Town of Erie, Ari Harrison. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Federal Heights, Linda Montoya. Okay. Uh, Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. No? Okay. Uh, Firestone, Don Cognac. Uh, David Whelan, Town of Firestone. Okay. Town of Foxfield, Josie Cockrell or Lisa Jones. Okay. Town of Georgetown, Lynette Kelsey. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, City of Glendale, Rachel Blinkley. City of Golden, Paul Hazeman. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Greenwood Village, George Lance. Uh, David Kerber. Okay. Uh, City of Idaho Springs, Chuck Harmon. Okay. City of Lafayette, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Hello. Uh, City of Lakewood, Jeslyn Cherizzi. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Larksburg, Isaac Levy. Okay. Uh, City of Littleton, Stephen Barr. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Lock Bowie, Kate Bristow. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of Lone Tree, Winshaw. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of Longmont, Joan Peck. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of Louisville, Dietrich Hoffner. 
Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Lions, Holly Rogan. Here. Perfect. Uh, Town of Mead, Colleen Whitlow. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Morrison, Paul Sutton. Uh, or Adam White. Okay. Uh, Town of Nederland, uh, Tom Maholt. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, City of North Glen, Richard Kondo. Or Tim Long. Okay. Uh, Town of Parker, Joan, uh, John Dyack. Uh, I'm here. Thank you. Um, City of Sheridan, Sally DeGaulle. Sally's here. Glad to hear it. Uh, Town of Superior, Neil Shaw. Or Sandy Hammerly. Uh, City of Thornton, Jessica Sandgren. Or Julia Marvin. Okay. City of Westminster, Sarah Nurmella. Here. Or, oh, thank you. Uh, City of Wheat Ridge, Bud Starker. Present. Thank you. Uh, and then CDOT, Darius Pakbaz. Okay. Uh, how about CDOT, uh, Sally Cheffy? And then RTD, Brian Welch. Okay. Okay, Mr. Chair, that is tonight's roll call for now. Thank you very much. And thanks to Cam Kennedy for stepping in and doing that. Melinda Stevens is on a well deserved vacation. And so Cam stepped in, and, and this is a long list to make it through with the roll call. So thank you very much for, for doing that and for your role. Uh, before we move to approve the agenda, I just want to remind everyone why this is a special meeting, much like what we did a month ago. Uh, that doesn't presuppose we will take any action, but if it's a workshop, we are not able to take any action. So just since we're talking about a legislative issue, we made the call to have it be a special meeting just in case we, we wanted to take a, an action. With that said, uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Looking for a hand. Uh, Director Shaw. Move to approve the agenda. And uh, Director Starker for the second? Second. Thank you. I saw you raise your hand as well, so I appreciate Quick. that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, any discussion? All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Aye. And any abstention? We have an agenda. A brief report of the chair. Uh, for those of you that have RSVP'd for the retreat, thank you very much. We have great numbers. We have awesome numbers that have RSVP'd. Uh, if you have not RSVP'd still, there is time. Please RSVP uh, for the retreat in general or the dinner on Friday. If you're going to the dinner, uh, you probably got a, an email from Cam uh, asking for your meal choice. Pre please get that in as soon as possible so he can uh, get that catering order handled. So if not, if not, if not, you're having chicken. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so please, uh, again, thank you for everybody that's, that's RSVP. It should be a, a great time. With that said, we will move ahead to public comment if there is any. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, is there any public comment that you're aware of? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any at this time, but I'll give it a second just to see if we have any hands raised. And I don't believe we do. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So we will move ahead uh, with our consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is the summary of the April 19th, 2023 meeting? Uh, Director Starker. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Great. And Director Hurst? Do you have the second? Second. second. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any conversation on the consent agenda? Um, I, I wasn't listed as present. This is Tom Mahold. I was at the meeting. Fantastic. Thank you for highlighting that. I appreciate that. So uh, I assume the movement and the second are fine with that change being made to accurately reflect the attendance. Any other changes or comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed aye. nay? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. With that, we will move on to the uh, uh, main show, the action item. 
which is a discussion on state legislative issues. Uh, obviously, foremost in that is Senate Bill 23-213. Doug, do you want to provide introductory comments? I will, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, very much. And it's great seeing everyone this evening. I can't hear. I can't hear you either. Here to Doug. Doug's on mute. I can't hear either. Well, there you go. That's my fault. Oh, <laughs> all right. Here we go. It was it was awesome. I'll say it again. So it was fantastic. I, I just want to take a few minutes. And first of all, it's great to see everyone this evening. Um, they just take a few minutes of how we plan to to, to kind of uh, roll this out from staff perspective tonight. Um, but I also wanted to just share with you both that uh, share with you all that, um, you know, we, as you notice, we did not send out any additional materials to you all since we posted the agenda last week, because quite frankly, we didn't know really what to send you. Um, as, as you can imagine, you know, as we know, it's changed four times since, uh, since the agenda went out, the latest being, of course, last night at about 1130. So um, I, I know many of you are aware of what's, what's currently in the House version of the bill. And um, staff will be highlighting uh, uh, some of those some of those aspects, most notably as it relates to the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which Dr. Cog is. Um, but first, before we do that, our own Jen, uh, Jennifer Castle, our lobby, one of our lobbyists, she's got just kind of kind of roll out exactly how we've gotten here, where we are, and where we're going, um, just to give you some idea and concept about uh, the changes that have been made. And then uh, Sheila Lynch on our staff, our director of regional planning and development. She'll provide a short presentation, just kind of highlighting some of the major aspects of those changes. And then, of course, all of us will be available for any questions you might have um, or, you know, any clarifications to the bill that you wish to see. We'll be happy if we don't know the answers, we'll, we'll, we'll search those out for you. So without further ado, Mr. Chair, I guess I'll turn it back to you and uh, you can invite Jen Castle. Jen Castle, uh, please welcome and thank you for being here tonight. Yes, of course. Thank you all. It's good to see you. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you, Jer Chair Conklin. Appreciate it. Good seeing you yesterday. Um, so just to kind of, I guess, give a little, little bit of an overview of where we are currently. Um, as Doug mentioned, I imagine most of you know what is happening down here. Um, I want to relay that as of last week, um, when this bill passed um, out of the Senate, most of us if not all of us were actually feeling pretty good. <laughs> um, most of us were kind of, you know, uh, clapping, uh, clapping each other's backs and hands and things, thinking that, hey, you know, this this bill could have been a lot worse. This this is a pretty good victory on our part. Um, but that did quickly change this week um, when 213 was introduced into in the the House. It was assigned to um, House Transportation and Local Government Committee. There is a super majority on that committee of nine to four. Um, so when that bill was introduced, we did know that the, the House sponsors of the bill, um, Representative Steve Woodrow from the Denver area, and then uh, Representative Iman Judah from Arapahoe County, uh, both of them did not give a commitment to CCI, CML, us, CCAT, um, that they wouldn't run any substantial amendments, nor did the governor's office. Uh, so there might have been a little bit of worry, but folks did seem pretty, they had a good solid feeling that this bill was not going to be changed substantially. Well, that wasn't in fact the case, of course. Um, so what, what happened, uh, the, we had a, a, a committee that was scheduled yesterday. Um, the committee, the House Transportation Local Government Committee ended up convening around three o'clock. And we were provided with some amendments or at least an outline of amendments. There was about 12 or so amendments that um, that were pushed through by the one of the House sponsors. And it, it became very it became very evident that the House did in fact intend to put back in some of the most concerning parts of that bill. Uh, specifically, they reinserted three of the mandates three of the four mandates that we saw in the introduced version of the bill. Um, of course, there's some other things um, as it relates to regional entities and NPOs 
um, that are a little bit concerning, of course, to Dr. Cog. But those are those three mandates, of course, are really you know the the big flashy red lights that are blaring at us for right now. The committee hearing yesterday uh, um, was a little bit different than it was in the Senate. Or actually, I shouldn't say a little bit different. It was very different. Um, for those of you who might have been in, in attendance or who listened, uh, there was barely any discussion. There were barely any questions, any comments from either or from I say either um, either party that was on the committee. Um, there, there was some thoughts in in the beginning when the sponsors were presenting the bill, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? But the, the Senate committee was a lot more um, engaged um, in, in, in the hearing. They were asking a lot more questions, questioning the witnesses more. Um, it, it was a very different scene um, and certainly a, a very different tone. There seemed to be a lot more uh, proponents this time around. And I think that was because obviously they were really pushing um, for these amendments to go on. And um, they also were definitely outflanked by the opponents in the Senate committee. So I think they um, they certainly put out a call to mobilize those individuals. Um, I rarely heard a question from any of the, the Democrats on the committee. Um, of course, committee members were going in and out um, as well. And they do have to do that sometimes, um, but it, it just it just was not a very engaged committee overall. It took about an hour, it, they, they, the committee hearing went somewhat the same. There were, were panels of proponents, panel of opponents. Um, it was timed. They were pretty strict about cutting off all of the testimony at about 10 o'clock. There were maybe 150, 160 or so folks that testified. Um, so a lot less, a lot smaller number but still the committee hearing went till about midnight, it took about an hour and a half to get through the amendments. And there was a lot of confusion on the amendments, rightfully so. So where we find ourselves currently, oh, excuse me, the bill did pass um, on a partisan vote from uh, nine to four. Um, the Republicans objected to every single one of the amendments that was put on the bill. And then of course they objected to the bill itself. Um, so where we are now, uh, I think a lot of folks are working to strategize today. Um, and in fact, CCI, CML, they're having a strategy meeting at 4.30. I'm gonna get caught up with them um, after this Zoom and we'll certainly inform Doug and Rich of what the, what the plan is moving forward. But the bill is going to be heard tomorrow morning in House Appropriations Committee. We do know that we have one no vote from the Democrats. Um, working to, we need two other Democrats to, to be able to kill that bill in committee. It's not likely to happen. It's also not likely to happen on the House floor. There is just too much of a majority um, that the Democrats have. To refresh your memory, it's 46 to 19. Um, so we would need a significant num number of Democrats to vote no. And it's, it's just not likely to happen. Um, the House Democrats are also the, the more liberal body. Um, here as well. So I imagine we'll get a couple of no votes from a handful of Democrats. I, and I imagine all of the Republicans um, will also vote no. Um, Jim, at this time, a, the, can I ask oh, a quick question? Yes. I apologize for interrupting, but about the Appropriations Committee, with all of those amendments that came in, how much is the fiscal mo money aspect? And do you see the Appropriations Committee, uh, like in the Senate, making amendments? or see them balking at all at things that have suddenly been added in? Or do you think it's just pretty much going to fly regardless of those things? Good question, Director Conklin. Um, I do not think it will be like the Senate Appropriations Committee. If you all remember, there were two very strong no votes on Senate Appropriations Committee. That's in fact how we got the bill to where it was in the Senate before, when it passed the Senate um, was the pressure that two um, members of the Senate Appropriations Committee, the pressure that they put on the majority leader in the Gov's office. Um, that's, that, they, they were strong enough. We don't believe that we have that in the House. Um, I think we probably have one, um, one Democrat, and that's uh, Representative Shannon Bird, um, who represents Westminster. Um, she, she is a no. However, we don't believe that we can get any, any of the other Democrats. So it will likely be very different. Um, they have not come out with a new fiscal note since committee action yesterday. I imagine it will be roughly the same. There's st 
from what I know, they're still planning on dedicating the $15 million to DOLA and a, you know, a handful of, of FTE as well. So I, I imagine that will be roughly the same, but I would assume maybe a new, it, well, a new fiscal note would have to come out before tomorrow's hearing for them to vote on it. So did that, does that answer your question, Director? Okay, great. Um, the only other thing that I was going to, or, well, that I was going to say, given that and given the temperature in the house, um, the governor's office is pull, putting on full court press, all the advocates are, and of course, a lot of the house Democrats. I saw them all huddling earlier today um, outside of the house chamber just this afternoon. So I, you know, they're up to something. They're doing their own strategizing as well too. So what I expect to then to happen if it passes out of the house, um, that our strategy, what I assume is going to happen is that we are going to put a full court press on the Senate. Um, we're gonna get the Senate uh, riled up, especially leadership. Um, we're going to lean on those senators that we know oppose the bill uh, to try to put pressure on leadership to reject the House amendments and force the bill into conference committee. Now, depending on who is on that conference committee, that will determine the outcome of the bill. If we have Senate leadership's ear, they will put certain senators on that conference committee that will advocate for us and demand certain changes. If they don't, they're gonna put those senators on the bill that you know, will, will say yes or will not advocate fully for the removal of those mandates. So really it all comes down to what Senate leadership is going to do with that conference committee. Um, a conference committee is gonna be made up of three uh, legislators from each chamber uh, with the Democrats having the majority of, of the six. So that really whoever's gonna be appointed to that conference committee is gonna tell us kind of what is gonna happen with that bill. Of course, you know, the Senate can, can reject the amendments. They don't go to conference committee, the bill could die. You know, who knows, but uh, you know, ultimately I think they will have a conference committee and, and that will determine the fate of the bill. Hopefully that all made sense. Doug, did I, did I miss anything or do I need to hit on anything else? I'm happy to answer any other questions or procedural questions that the General Assembly will have to go through with this bill. Uh, let's take some questions, Mayor Starker. Uh, thank you, uh, Gen uh, uh, Jennifer. After the, uh, after the conference committee, will it go back to both houses, both chambers for a final vote? That is correct, yes. Both chambers will have to accept the conference committee report. And then the bill will repass, yes. And how many hours are left in the session at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Director Walton. You have to, you have to start that calculation by saying there are 24 hours in the day times. <laughs> they've, uh, they've been putting it in. Thank you, Jen. Um, I have a day job. I'm not a city councilor uh, 24 hours a day. Could you, would you mind summarizing what did happen yesterday? Um, I'm, I guess I'm specifically interested in the things that are the, um, reddest lights for you. So you mentioned three of the four mandates. I don't know if that's a quick summary. Um, it's very likely I'm the only one, but I'm guessing I'm I'm not. <laughs> Actually, it's <laughs> not Director Walton and, and Sheila will be covering <laughs> oh, that okay. sort of detail here in just a, a few moments. Super so, duper. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Just any any other questions about process before we go to to, to Sheila to give us some of that that uh, detail. Uh, Director Mulvey. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any prospect of specific amendments being considered at this point. It kind of sounds like no, like on a specific topic that might be of concern besides the obvious mandate problem. That's a good question, uh, Director Mulvey. I, I think they would consider some technical type of amendments. Um, I know we very well might have an issue um, with a switch to MPOs. So, I think there could be actually, yes. Um, as far as the the ask of what the coalition is going to ask, um, as far as it goes, as it relates to the mandates, we're just gonna ask for them to not, to reject the conference committee that came out of the housing, the House Transportation Local Government Committee. We won't be successful on that, but that's what, that's the, that's what we are going to ask for the coalition. But I do, I do think technical amendments will come. Director Harrison. 
Thank you. And uh, Jen, one quick question in regard to all the local officials who testified, you know, in terms of wanting to keep their local control. What was the feedback from the House representatives in regard to all of that local control concern? What was their pushback against that in regard to that? Yes, thank you for that question, Director Harrison. A, a lot of it was um, local governments had their chance. Uh, we can't stick with the status quo. The state needs to intervene. That's what I heard, at least. That was the, the, the common themes. So it, it was certainly, yeah, it was certainly more, more of an adversarial attitude towards local government, local control than we heard in the Senate. It, it was there any more data adversarial. I'm sorry, Director Harrison, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, was there any data presented by local officials in regard to what the impact this would be so that we back it up with facts? There was a little bit, yes. I, I do know that there were a few mayors and council members that did speak to you know the number of units that were coming online, um, all the strategies that local governments have implemented, uh, grants and dollars that they have used for this. Um, so there, there was some, but you know, ultimately, sometimes data and, and um, rationality don't don't play all that well down here. <laughs> yes, understood. And Mr. Um, Conklin, you were going to say. No, it's going to something, something interesting, and I, I agree that that some of it was more adversarial. And and in the introductory remarks by the sponsors, there was that conversation about NIMBYs, and that kind of became a conversation about some of the elected saying the public process is good because you get both sides coming forward. And the sponsors kind of said that this is all designed to help local governments not have to deal with making those difficult decisions that we can't make because we're hearing from both sides. It, it, it was it was a little convoluted to me, but 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 that was part of the to to your question about what was the response. That was part of the response to that. Uh, and quite honestly, from the the uh, the Democrats, at least to a couple of the panels that I heard, there was some pretty aggressive uh, questioning of the the, the opponents. Uh, so it was it was it was a very different process than than the Senate. I think, Director Mulvey. Yeah, one of the technical amendments that I was sort of speaking to is something that I didn't yet hear any data on to Ari's point, and that is the fiscal impact on municipalities. The last version that I saw, I think it was the 20E, but it's been changed, but I looked at all the amendments. There's a new fiscal note from the other day that says there's extensive, it's May 1st, extensive fiscal impact on municipalities in order for them to comply. And I asked my manager for that. It takes a long time to put something like that together, but it's acknowledged that is a data point. I'm wondering if any of that was brought up in the hearing yesterday. Jim? I remember if I heard that con concern specifically, um, I, I imagine some folks did hit on that concern, um, it, and it and it will be a, um, you know an unfunded mandate. Local local governments, municipalities are going to have to change all of their zoning and, and their codes. It is certainly going to cost municipalities a lot of money. Um, though, however, that argument doesn't necessarily play out. That those dollars are not reflected in the fiscal note. Um, you know, the fiscal note just has the state impact. So it does absolutely reference and will reference uh, the impact to, to municipalities, but there, there won't be any hard numbers there. Um, and really it's just, it, you know, we can use that argument, but oftentimes legislators don't listen to it. Dr. Harrison. Yeah, and just to follow up in regard to ongoing developments that we have or anything that we're doing to help with affordability, do we, are, is there instruction that says that we have to put that on hold and revamp everything that we have to do? And, and Jen, you can either answer that or we can, or we can have Sheila yeah. take it a, a yeah, bite either of one. Yeah. I, thank you. Yes, I will um, defer to Sheila. I'm sure she is the expert on 
on all the amendments in the language. With, with okay. that, let's go ahead and go to Sheila. And Sheila, you can either answer that up front or through your comments, and then we'll get back to some questions after we've had some of the, the context from uh, Sheila Lynch. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Chair Conklin. And would you mind if I just started with a presentation and then we can go into questions? Would that work? Okay. That would be awesome. Thank you. Let me just start my... All right, are you all seeing the screen okay? We are. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I just want to start by saying I really appreciate Jen giving us the update on process because it certainly has been a wild process um, that we've all experienced um, with this bill. And we are going to go over, or I'm going to go over really the high level changes, but I'm joined today by Andy Taylor, um, who is a wealth of information. He's been diving deep into this bill as well. It's truly been a team effort as the changes have been coming fast and furious. So, um, First slide. So wanted to just um, touch again on housing needs assessments. Honestly, this is part of the bill that hasn't changed all that much. Um, these are the uh, assessments that will be conducted by DOLA. One of the things that has changed along the way is that the um, they will be need to be updated every six years. It, I think previous version said five years. Um, the other thing that's changed is that the different groups that are advising the process have been updated a bit. I won't go into details of membership of some of these groups because those have been amended several times and re-amended. Um, so there are new committees that will assist the multi-agency advisory committee, the urban area subcommittee and the rural resort area subcommittee. And both of those are an advisement to, uh, to, uh, to DOLA through this process. The other group that was created um, is a legislative oversight committee concerning affordable housing and homelessness. And so just wanted to, to note that, that those have been some of the entities that have changed in this bill. So with housing needs planning, um, one of the things I'll just point, point out is that the way the bill is structured has changed a bit. Um, housing needs planning, they've kind of broken it out into urban municipalities and then rural resort communities. So there's slightly different guidance for, for the different geographies. We've focused most of our comments here on the urban municipalities because that applies to our region. Um, so, you know, in by 20, end of 2024, DOLA will release some guidance. Um, and then two years later is when urban municipalities will have to submit their housing needs plans. And the recurrence or how, how often they need to update those has changed from five years to six years. There's still um, an opportunity in, in the bill to opt out for communities below 25,000 in population and annual median income of less than 55,000. So um, there's still that option. There is still the um, the uh, content in the bill that allows urban municipalities who have already conducted housing needs plans to not have to start all over, but can build on those plans, can use those plans in the process. Um, wanted to point out the key elements. A lot of them are still the same, but there's a couple, couple differences. One, um, there's a lot more guidance related to displacement risk assessment and mitigation strategies. Um, there is a little uh, adjustments to the language around regional housing needs plans. And since that applies to Dr. Cog, really wanted to zero in on that. So um, I think it calls out MPOs, uh, counties, and municipalities can participate uh, or may participate in a regional housing needs plan. And some of the things that have been pointed out more clearly is that those regional housing needs plans much, must must um, uh, or actually are encouraged to incorporate the strategic growth areas that are discussed in the bill. Um, and it speaks specifically to identifying strategies and commitments to address the needs for those regional housing strategies. Um, the other new piece is the, um, a strategic growth and housing mix analysis is required and MPOs will have to conduct that. I think when we spoke to you last, there was something in the bill called a buildable lands analysis. So that's been taken out and now it's been redefined as a strategic growth and housing mix analysis. So 
if you've been paying attention to all the different iterations, at one point it seemed like the geographies that we um, that had, were in the bill as introduced had kind of become less relevant, and now they're relevant yet again. So we wanted to put this map in front of you again. Um, tier one and tier two urban municipalities um, are probably most relevant to our region and most relevant to the um, the policy areas that are currently in the bill. So we thought it'd be simple enough to just kind of compare where were we with those key policy areas that Jen mentioned at the at, as the bill is introduced to where are we today. So if you recall, there were four areas, accessory dwelling units, middle housing, transit oriented areas, and key corridors when it was introduced. And now three of the four uh, remain in the bill. They were taken out and then they, they were put back in. And so middle housing, that section is no longer a part of the bill. Um, accessory dwelling units are included, though what's been changed is where they apply. So they're in tier one and tier two communities. And then the transit oriented areas and key corridors were combined into one section called corridors and centers requirements. Um, and transit oriented areas still remain in tier one communities. Um, one thing I will note there is that in as introduced, they it did not apply to transit oriented areas that were in unincorporated counties, and now they do. Um, and then in the key corridors, um, it's focused now in tier one urban municipalities. The process that we showed you before still remains. It is um, essentially DOLA will create a model code and communities have, it well, in the bill, there are minimum standards described for those three policy areas. Communities can adopt those minimum standards. They can even, if communities have already adopted um, land use regulations that address the minimum standards, they just need to show DOLA that they've done that. And then if communities um, do not adopt the minimum standards, then they have the option to adopt the model code. And if they take no action, then the model code will go into effect. So the process generally um, stays the same. I we wanted to show this map of the transit oriented areas because you'll see um, the blue color shows the tier one communities. And there are areas where you see that it's not shaded in blue, but you see the circles which represent our transit oriented areas. And those are in unincorporated portions of a county. Those are now included, the transit oriented area, um, uh, the uh, regulations in the, in the bill will apply to, to those areas. The other thing we wanted to point out is that there were several components kind of towards the end of the bill as introduced and that um, some of those things have changed and some there's more content in that section. So we wanted to make sure to call that out because it does uh, um, apply to municipalities. So um, just to highlight a few, there were um, uh, there's now um, there's still content in there around manufactured housing. There is also um, there originally were regulations in there around um, occupancy limits, not allowing occupancy limits, and that has been, I guess, loosened a bit. So as the way we describe it is very limited opportunity for occupancy restrictions based on um, familial status. Um, the other thing we wanted to point out is that there are, there's uh, guidance in there about strategic growth areas and how that applies to state funding, really trying to align state funding with the uh, strategic growth objectives. I mentioned the strategic growth and housing mix analysis. There's also a natural and agricultural land priorities report that um, MPOs will need to, to um, consult and water loss audit reporting. On the right side of the screen, one of the things that has, um, I would say, expanded a bit is the guidance for comp plans. So now comp plans will need to include the items on this list. I won't go through all of them. The other key thing to point out is that comp plans will need to be adopt, uh, updated every 10 years. 
So we wanted to ground us in, so what does this mean for MPOs? We showed you this slide the last time we shared with you and not a ton has changed. Um, so it for um, the definition of regions, um, the state is will match the boundaries of an MPO for a regional housing needs assessment. Current MPO plan investments would inform location of key corridors. Um, I mentioned the natural and agricultural land priorities report that we will be a user of that. We also will have an opportunity to, to receive and potentially be a pass through for some of the technical assistance that's mentioned in the bill. Um, and the strategic growth objectives that MPO regional transportation plan must be consistent with those. MPOs, um, the, the piece that we had the line before because the those above the line were as introduced and then they had added some pieces. So MPOs do have a seat on the multi-agency advisory committee. Um, it is called out that regional entities may lead housing needs plans. One thing that has changed is this second to last bullet. So before we had told you that MPOs had to complete a buildable lands analysis, that is now gone, but we have to complete a strategic growth and housing mix analysis. And we can be a recipient of technical assistance funding for key corridors. So that summarizes at a very high level, most of the changes and happy to answer any other questions. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's how you spent most of the day working on uh, on trying to assimilate and summarize things. Uh, before we go to Director Flynn, uh, Sheila, the question that we had before that leading into that, um, is that still out there or did we get that answered? Um, probably not in regard to the zoning aspect of it. So for anything that's in flight that we're working on today or that's been part of our affordability strategy that we're doing, do we have to be put on hold and, re and redo all of that? going forward um, and also the impacts to those developers that are trying to help us with those needs. Um, there's obviously going to be a, a pretty big delay, I would imagine. Yeah, I'll take a stab at trying to answer that as we mm -hmm. understand it. So I think with the policy areas, especially related to adjusting land development regulations or zoning, there is a date related to each of those sections. And so communities would have until that date to adopt the minimum standards. So if you're working on something now, as long as it gets adopted by that point, um, then it would be fine. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, I, I think I can presume to speak for Denver that when we update our comp plan, we will not include a we will not include a three-mile annexation plan. Uh, otherwise, Frida Poundstone would be spinning in her grave. Uh, the ADU, putting back the ADU mandate, uh, was is it identical to the mandate that was in the original uh, bill? Um, the reason I ask, we just completed about a year and a half uh, large public outreach and involvement uh, to design forms and standards for ADUs in every residential area, including my suburban context where we have none at the moment because we have no alleys. And what I read in the original bill seemed to usurp some of the uh, standards and for instance, the rear setback when you don't have an alley, we, we have a recommended rear setback of 10 feet from your backyard neighbor. And I recall the original bill said it could be no more than five feet. Uh, which cuts it in half and, and puts people's ADUs right next to each other. We also limited the height of a suburban context ADUs to one story, 17 feet. Uh, but what I read in the original bill said that uh, all ADUs, uh, ADUs cannot have any more restrictive uh, standard than the primary structure on the lot. Uh, so if you had a two-story house like I do, uh, I could have a two-story uh, ADU right up against my neighbor's back fence. Uh, can you, either Sheila or Jen, can you tell me what the ADU mandate now consists of? I can take a, a stab at what I believe it is. I think what they added in is that um, municipalities cannot restrict an ADU's or 
require setbacks greater than the primary dwelling unit or an accessory structure. So, okay. and they took out the specific five feet. Okay, because we allow a shed five feet. We allow garages to be uh, right uh, on, a, on the zero lot line mm -hmm. on the side yard. Uh, that's kind of scary. Uh, Jen, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, thank you, Director Flynn. The only thing I would add is that I, I know that it, and they, it, <clears throat> excuse me, an attempt is going to be made to amend that um, since so many communities allow ADUs and have their own ADU restrictions in place. Um, there's going to be an amendment that would essentially say if, if your community already has this, they can abide by their own set of standards rather than having the, you know, the model code that DOLA implements for this. So I don't know how likely it is that that amendment will be accepted, um, but I'll certainly be tracking it. Can I get Thank clarification you. on uh, Director Flynn's question, though? Director Flynn talked about how a garage can have zero setback. What I heard, heard Sheila say is that this now says you can't have a more restrictive setback. So that does that mean that that ADU could have no setback because the garage has no setback? That is a very good question. And I think there's probably some interpretation in there if the intention was garages, because it just says no, um, a minimum setback that's that's great. You can't have something that's greater than what's required for the main structure or another accessory. Um, uh, right. Sorry, and, the, and other accessory buildings. So mm -hmm. that I, would I wish be there an interesting. Been maybe a little, yeah. I'm sorry, Sheila. I wish there might have been a little more intentional discussion about ADUs. I know everybody looks on them as some sort of uh, uh, great advance for affordability. I had our assessor uh, during this process the last year and a half run numbers, and in the years 20 and 21, Denver had it on the order of 200. Uh, resales of residential properties that had ADUs in Denver, and the median sales price was $900,000. So people should be mindful that when you add an ADU to a residential lot, you have made it unaffordable on resale to anybody right. with a lower median income. Thank you. Director Mulvey. Hi, a couple of quick questions, and um, I would concur with that affordability issue, which I've raised previously. My I'm going to be real specific and targeted. So if they can't be answered, forgive me and just tell me that. Um, the first concern that I have, and I'm trying not to repeat a thing said, was on the committee, the advisory committee. It appears as though the majority or supermajority are within the control of the governor, appointed by the governor. So the way I read it, at least half of them are appointed by the governor, including the MPO appointments. So was there any speaking on that in committee? Shannon or Shannon? I mean, by government, governor, I mean, and or a government or executive agency. It just, um, it's the agency issue that concerns me. Mm -hmm. Director Mulvey, yes, that was mentioned a few times. Um, it wasn't a common theme, but it, it, it was mentioned and um, there wasn't much response to it. Yeah, I got a term for that, but I won't say it in mixed company. Um, the exposure to municipal liability we already asked about, but my question has to do with the exposure to litigation. Um, if there is a failure to comply with the code, so for example, the homeowner wants to build an ADU and I can't because the municipality says no or their code is poor, the legal standard in there seems to be uh, at one point in, in feasibility. It's, it's rather vague. Is there any speaking on those topics? I do not remember hearing that. Oh, thank you. My next one is that there's now a very specific provision in the last version that I saw in the amendments that expressly invalidates HOA declarations and covenants without a voter input by the HOA. Was there any speaking about that? I did not hear that concern. 
I, I strongly oh. think that as elected officials, we may not, through this context, be able to say it as a Dr. Cog MPO concern, but it's a it exposes our municipalities to legal liability in some ways because the remedy is against the municipality, not necessarily against the legislature. And then my last question has to do with what seems to me to be a bit of a quid pro quo with respect to funding. I saw that there are two categories. One is for the MMOF funding that says um, DOLA requires it to be consistent uh, with the strategic objectives plan and um, the resulting codes, and that that's an actual requirement for any MMLF funding. The second one I saw was that all other transportation funding must be consistent with strategic growth as determined by the director of DOLA, that it would, that that's more as a judgment call. And then the third one doesn't relate to us as much. That's the economic development funding is also required. And I've, I've got citations to this because it concerns me so much, if that's necessary. Was there any conversation on those topics? I don't remember hearing that either. Um, I know there was some question of, uh, Adola being so involved, OEDIT being being included, um, those kind of thoughts, but specifically as it relates to um, dollars being distributed, I don't believe so. I, I, as part of this body, I would be concerned about the Title 43 rem the conditions being placed on the funding that for transportation. I can understand the MMOF a little bit because that relates to an objective for doing this type of land use, but all others, I don't. And the fact that it goes to being consistent with a strategic growth objective for which we our only participation is a recommendation as a member of a committee to the people that make the strategic growth of objectives with hearings that are published in a print newspaper, it's there's zero oversight and there's zero participation. And those things concern me when it comes to all the time and energy we put as an entity into transportation funding criteria and evaluation. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Director Mulvey. Jen, can I ask a question? And this may be one that you 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 can you can say no comment. Doug can throw something at me across the table. Obviously, through this process, there's been a lot of conversation about the concern that this may bring up legal challenges for issues of, of home rule and 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 you you've got the issue with HOAs and their covenants and and it sounds like there may be a lot of parties that may believe that they have uh, uh, standing. I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. If there are lawsuits, does that put the entire thing on hold till those get resolved? Do those lawsuits just go after specific aspects, aspects of the bill? What Can you project any of the legal entanglements that we've heard lots about and, and how those would play out? And, and if that's an inappropriate question, I apologize. Well, that's, that's all right, Director Conklin. And I will just repeat what I've heard um, folks say is that those legal challenges will likely come. Um, it's almost certain that they will come. Um, and that, yes, it would absolutely halt the process and the progress of this bill. And so, yes, a, lo a lot of folks have been mentioning that, you know, first off, there's nothing in this bill that guarantees that affordable housing is going to come overnight. And then, two, there are going to be legal challenges that will slow the process, that, you know, that's just going to delay a lot of things. So that has been said publicly um, from a lot of folks, from a lot of attorneys, CML's attorneys have mentioned that. I believe CCIs have as well. And I guess my question is, and, and maybe there's other legislation in the past that you could refer to, 
if if there are legal challenges, and let's say that legal challenge is to the the covenants about HOA being thrown out or whatever, does does the that challenge put the entire piece of legislation on hold, or are there parts of it that would be able to continue proceeding? Do we end up getting a mixed thing where we've got to be interpreting which of these are moving and which of them aren't because of some of those challenges? Does, does that question make sense? The question does make sense, and I would maybe look to someone who may be an, an attorney who knows, I guess, more about um, administrative Oh, fair processes enough. whether fair or enough. not yeah right. very fair response <laughs> uh director shaw thank you and and i guess mine may be more of an a question for an attorney but um i've wondered if it might make more sense if this passes for our municipalities to not adopt the model code and let it be forced upon us uh, and treat it, if we must, like an overlay. So we have a 10-foot lot line requirement, and it says five, or it says whatever, and uh, and and we then go to the uh, model code and then revise our, our plan approvals accordingly, but that we do not incorporate this in our in our plans, I don't know. But again, question perhaps for an attorney. I think one of the comments was this is an employment act for attorneys. I think all of our city attorneys may be uh, <laughs> like very engaged in, defects. In, in conversations like that with our bodies in terms of the strategy for, for moving forward. Yeah. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. Uh, other questions or comments? Director Mulvey. There is a construction defect component that concerns me in terms of, um, aside from what was said in the original hearings, removing the ability to enforce standards on modular housing actually could create a situation where they basically say modular housing standards have to be the same as regular single family standards. And that's 3123301 stuck out to me. It's that sets you up for a problem from the construction defect standpoint because they're completely different types of construction. So, ouch. Fair observation. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. <clears throat> Well, I, I appreciate staff and and uh, the conversation in terms of this. Obviously, we still don't know what this thing looks like in the end. Uh, there can, of course, be amendments during uh, you know the the process of voting out on the house. There can be other amendments. Uh, you know, so I, I think we are far from knowing exactly what this looks like. Uh, I guess we would hope that 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 mixed house or that. Uh, uh, middle housing is not somehow mysteriously added back under the the, the cover of, of night. Uh, you know, I would encourage folks to still be contacting the the folks you've been contacting because it's not over yet. Uh, but uh, it's it's obviously a, an interesting process we've been through. Director Moldy. I see. Okay, uh, Director Baker. Thank you. I was just wondering if uh, Executive Director Rex can tell us um, uh, if there are any plans for he or any of our staff to um, be submitting any uh, suggested amendments, any um, or a staff um, planning to um, submit any amendments or letters of, of support, or are we waiting to hear from the other community partners such as CCI and CML? Rex? Chairman, if I may, yeah, no, thank you for the question, Director Baker. Um, yes, I mean, we've been actively engaged, of course, at, with CCI and CML on, on this bill, as, as Jen alluded to earlier, which parts of this, the, this coalition. Um, um, you know, we have provided some technical um, recommendations to the plan, stuff that was in conflict throughout the bill, and, you know, those types of things for sure. 
um, primarily as it relates to the metropolitan planning stuff in particular, um, or the regional planning stuff in particular. But if there's anything specifically, and I think this is part of the reason, right, that we, we decided to um, use this meeting as a special meeting versus a work session, if there's specific you know, direction that the board would like to provide to 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 us as staff to um, you know to to bring forth, then we'd be happy to do that. So I just I just throw that out there in case there's any interest in it. Great, thank you, Director Lady. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I really appreciate all the work staff has done on this bill. It's been so complex and fast moving, and Sheila to have. Uh, prepared such a great analysis when we didn't even know what the bill was going to look like until midnight last night. Um, you know, I appreciate you were probably working most of the night. Just two, one quick point and then a question. Um, I think on, on you know, small, very discreet um, technical cleanup type things like what Director Flynn mentioned around setbacks around garages. I, I think that the House would would consider amendments like that on the floor. Um, you know, that's if, if there's something that's not clear, rather than, you know, have something ambiguous that we're going to have to deal with and interpret, I, I think the House, just in my experience, would, would like to go ahead and know about that and clean it up. So, you know, if we can identify things like that that aren't policy issues, let's go ahead and take our shot. The question I have, though, um, I, maybe it's for um, uh, for Director Rex um, about the the provisions on um, the state strategic priorities and the directive that um, that the CDOT and OEDIT and DOLA funds be um, awarded consistent with those priorities. And I'm wondering what your take is on, on what that means for us as an MPO. Mr. Chairman, uh, Director Levy, thank you very much for the question. And I hope Ron Papstorf is on here because we actually specifically reached out uh, to CDOT to seek some clarification on that area. Um, and it's my understanding that they are referring primarily to grants that CDOT actually administers and not uh, MPO funding, for example, that flows through CDOT, if, that, uh, if you understand that distinction. But I will ask Ron if he just wants to share a little bit more. Yeah, um, sure. Um, Chair Conklin, Director Levy, thank you. Ron Papstorf, Transportation Planning Director. Um, we, we looked pretty carefully at that, <clears throat> at that section that's on page 96 of the engrossed bill that came out of the Senate related to um, grant funds administered by CDOT. And we were, we were initially concerned that that might apply to funds that flow through CDOT to us, federal funds that we allocate through our TIP. Um, not, the, not the least worry um, in that if that applied to us, we're just wrapping up, as you all know, the allocation of about $450 million worth of federal and state transportation funds through this TIP through fiscal year 27. And the idea of having to go back and, and try to align those with yet to be defined uh, state growth objectives um, kind of um, had us very concerned. It's our understanding that the intent and that language applies only to those grant funds administered by CDOT directly. So think of the Safer Main Streets program the transportation alternatives program that that funds that they allocate themselves. So when they are granting out funds to projects, um, and then I'll take this opportunity while I have the floor, if you don't mind, please, to refer please. back to um, Director Moby's question about the multimodal options fund money. That is one. That is one um, component of the bill that we have weighed in with. Um, uh, the sponsors and the governor's office about because again. We're just wrapping up the process of allocating all of our allocation of multimodal options funds through fiscal year 27 and to go back and try to revisit or rethink or justify uh, those project selections in this bill we think is um, a little unreasonable and an overreach and we'd like to at least make it prospective after that. Um, if not preferably limited just to those multimodal options funds that are administered directly by CDOT themselves for the state portion. If, if I could follow up, that's, that's really 
that that's helpful to know um and it that corrects a, a misunderstanding that i had uh that it included cdot funds that flow through the mpos to be allocated because um i actually had been hoping um that this could help us with the our um uh, our mitigation action um plan on the greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements that we have where if you know in out years we find that we do need to go with those mitigation action plans then there there would be some um something that would give us a little more teeth to say we're uh, we're going to be able to achieve those targets so thanks for that 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 helps me mr rex well, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Levy, just to expand on that, Ron, stay stay on stay on the line here because I might need your I might need to call a friend on this. But my understanding is part of the bill it does require our regional transportation plan to be in compliance with those strategies, right? So, um, so there still is that connection, right, between between our regional planning work that we do and the uh, strategic um, growth objectives. Thank you. Uh, a lot of our members uh, testified either in front of the Senate or in front of the House, heard some of them that were fantastic. Uh, Steve Odoricio, uh, thank you for your great work testifying yesterday among many of the folks here, but uh, really appreciate your, your efforts while you were there. So, and it's your turn to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me, sir? We can. Okay. Um, I, I think it's, I think um, what, what Doug is asking, and I think what we're talking about is good. You know, I was very optimistic last time saying, hey, throw in all the amendments you think you want, whether you want to kill this thing or not. Um, I, I'm I'm beat down. I, I, I'm, I'm out of it. Like, I think it's, we are going to get what we get. And, uh, but I do think it does make sense to give Doug, whether it's these technical things, like Claire was talking about, or the uh, substantive things, uh, at least do the best we can to give staff something to talk about and to work towards other than just killing the bill at the very end because maybe some of it will stick it doesn't necessarily mean uh we have to uh say it's we're appreciative of where the bill ends up but, but it might help us in some of these things and i think those are those areas where you can focus on safe harbors and exceptions for example i love the idea if you're if you have an adu program then maybe you're exempt from having to do their model adu program kind of use the same language that they're using in these other model codes. Um, as far as the stuff, uh, Claire, I pr appreciate what you're saying. Maybe if we can have it as an option that rather than a forcible teeth, that's where you and I are gonna always disagree on. I just don't want Dr. Cog telling people like Adams County who's 72 miles wide and is continuing to grow um, uh, that that this body gets to say, we, we can't get certain funding, but I will agree with you that that's not that we can establish uh, smart growth, um, some criteria, uh, that, or at least some guidance on smart growth. I just don't want to see, uh, just like, and I've said it before, just because Denver Boulder quit growing doesn't mean the rest of us have to be, and we're funneling all of the resources back into the haves when there's a lot of have-nots that are just trying to get by. And a lot of the reasons why we have people living on the outskirts of the metro area is because they simply can't afford to live on the inside. And, and so I just want us to keep in mind that we don't punish those folks and those communities that simply aren't uh, part of the um, part of the haves and, and that already have RTD, that already have all of the infrastructure, because a lot of us are still trying to build all that. Uh, so those are my comments. Great. Thank you very much. And on the same panel that uh, Director Odoricio was on, uh, Mayor Starker was on. And again, Mayor Starker, thank you for your great work. Uh, Director Wheel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, small point, and you know, I, uh, Cherry Hill still, we we love the objectives, uh, you know, affordable housing, but but are not, uh, you know, in support of this this bill as a method to get there. Um, technical cleanup item. I'd raised the point last uh, last meeting about uh, the half mile circle around a train station being sort of simple. Uh, simplistic uh, as the crow flies, if you will. Uh, we've got a situation where it, it's two miles. There, you, you, if you walked or drove or rode a bicycle, 
um, you would have to go uh, under an underpass and over to the entrance to the, uh, um, so, so within that circle, you actually have to travel two miles if you're a person trying to get from the outer edge of that circle to the entrance to the train station. They put some words in that talked about entrance. The last version I read, which could have changed, but it seems like it should be a half a mile as roads, uh, paths, you know, I, go. If that is that making any sense? Uh, put more specifically, you'd have to cross Interstate 65, um, shit, Interstate 25, to get from the station to the outer reach of the circle. And to avoid doing that, you have to take the roads and the roads go, you know, across under underpass and underpasses and back down and so on. So it, it seems like their intent is that it be in within walking distance or bicycle distance or short driving distance uh, with that half mile. The circle is too simplistic, is, is my point. Should be half a mile from the entrance. I think I can answer the questions that are in there. We did look at drafting a different defin alternative definition that would be more of what we would call the network distance, but really that as traveled diff distance. Um, it is really hard to kind of fit that technical of a definition in something like this. And so the other idea that we've been talking about is really treating this more like the key corridors of this is something that they have some guidance of what that's going to include, but there's another group that's going to actually do the mapping of it. And so that could be another approach that that, that this uh, this board could consider uh, um, having us try and uh, push in there as like a technical amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila, Doug, did you have any addition to that? I don't, Mr. Chairman, I, I might just mention that Director Nirmala put a comment in there referring to a half a walk shed uh, versus the radius. Um, that might be a, a simple approach to it. I, I kind of like the idea, but it was something we'll talk about internally if there's, and, and we'll continue those discussions with uh, with the governor's office and staff. Director Maurer. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> yeah, City of Centennial is still not in support of <coughs> Um, yeah, our mayor testified yesterday. Yeah, we're still pretty unhappy about how things have gone backwards. But nonetheless, just going along with the conversation, is there any, and I'm and then I'm asking um, Jennifer and Sheila if there's any opportunity that cities can be brought into the conversations when you know they're looking at amendments or whatever. And I don't know if that would work with the conference committee. But there's so many agencies that have started studies and there's a wealth of information we are learning and we could bring that knowledge forward. And it just seems like we should be at the table, at least, you know, at least some of us that are going, okay, let's tell you what we're learning here and what could help us meet your objectives. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, part of the challenge is they are now playing beat the clock. And yeah, you know, that that you know, one of the questions is how sound are some of the things at this point when you're trying so hard to come in under the, the buzzer, under the wire. Um, and there were actually some people in, in making comments that, that, that mused, wondering if that was almost the intention too, with this being introduced at the point it was in the session, that it would eventually push it to a point that something just had to happen. Uh, Director Dietz. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Uh, I do agree with uh, previous uh, Tammy. Uh, Castle Rock does not see any version of this that's worth a hoot. Um, I get that we would like to see the least of this version, period. But Castle Rock, we all know what may follow. And to hear that possibly many of these people in these committees and Dolan and stuff will be appointed people. Again, local control folks, it's all about local control and what we can do with our own money. I do appreciate everybody's work on this. Thank you so much, everybody. That's all. Right, thank you, Director Teets. 
want to be sensitive to time. We're about quarter after five. Uh, if there are other comments, want to be sure you have a chance to make those, but also don't want to uh, just keep meeting for the sake of meeting if, if there are not comments to be added. Uh, Director Hurst. Yeah, I appreciate everybody's uh, previous comments. Commerce City is um, likely part of the reason that this bill was put in place um, because we've had our challenges. We are still, um, we, we rarely vote nine zero on anything, and we're still nine zero against this bill. Um, and But I will say our last four projects we approved have been affordable housing projects. And without changes in metropolitan district uh, regulations, Commerce City would never support something like this. And, and, and we think it's, you know, basically laughable that the state representatives have done nothing about metropolitan districts and uh, decided to go this route. Thank you very much. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the Broomfield still remains in an opposition position. Um, but I just wanted to add, I wish the state would also acknowledge its effect it's had on getting us where we are with this in terms of its policies. And then also the federal government has uh, had policies over the past decades that have gotten us to where we are with this affordability issue. Um, and I do wish the state would have given us uh, even more tools to deal with affordability issues, such as amending uh, CRS 3812-301 um, to remove that prohibition we have on requiring um, affordable units outright, because that has been one challenge Broomfield has had is developers are more than happy right now to continue paying our opt-out fee for affordable units and that fee per unit does not match what it costs to build a unit and we'd rather have the units than the money to be quite frank um so that's all i really wanted to add to this conversation thank you very much director ward director flynn hey mr chair uh just to add to the uh to the counter, Denver remains opposed to the bill. I verified that with the administration uh, before this meeting. But uh, I wonder, at, at the risk of uh, extending our discussion a little further, uh, if uh, Sheila or Jen can comment on the anti-displacement, anti-gentrification uh, uh, measures that are in the bill as it currently stands. Because frankly, my biggest concern is that uh, any of this upzoning that does occur. I know middle housing has been taken out and it's just transit corridors and stations um, and ADUs. Uh, but my biggest concern about the bill has been that uh, this would put a displacement target on my at-risk neighborhoods. I represent a district where uh, households of color have been moving because they're gentrified out of places like Five Points and Sloan's Lake and Villa Park. Uh, they're coming to Southwest Denver because we have single unit zoning that's still relatively affordable. Uh, so my concern is that it will put a target on my little neighborhoods like Brentwood around Lincoln High School, where the dirt's more valuable than the house, uh, because we won't see quads built in Country Club or Hilltop or Belcaro. We'll see investors come to my uh, working family neighborhoods. That's what concerns me. So what do we have in the bill that gives us any ability to push back on displacement? <laughs> I can, sure, I can get us started and please chime in Jen or Andy if you have more to add. There's a lot that's been added in the in the last few rounds of, of the discussions to require analysis to understand the areas of highest risk for displacement and then also um, some mandates for DOLA to develop some strategies, a menu of strategies similar to the affordable affordability strategies that are called out in the bill. There's also a lot of guidance about who, who and how they should develop input into that menu of strategies, which you know expands to organizations, community-based organizations that have the most experience working with people who have experienced mm -hmm. displacement. And yet one of the things that I think we've reflected on is the timing because there's still a very fast timing in terms of adopting minimum standards in the policy areas and will communities have the opportunity to to um to 
uh, really implement some of those strategies in that time frame. Um, maybe I'll just stop there. I, but, and, and I'm going to take a, a moment and, and jump in before I get to Director Dyack. Uh, so the, the, the menu of strategies for displacement, it seems that the policy in itself is creating a situation that lends itself to displacement in Director Flynn's area, in, in Edgewater, in, in other places. It is foreseeable to see what is happening because we see it happening now and we work to combat that, but now our ability to combat that is being taken away in many ways through this, this, this bill. So the menu of strategies for displacement, I assume that is not doing something to try to have displacement not happen. Is it just acknowledging displacement's gonna happen? So here are ways you can deal with it. A lot of things we're telling you you can't do, but these are the things that, that we have have deemed you you can do to make up for the negative effects of this bill. Is that fair, or am I I misinterpreting? I think it's hard. To, I'll just add that I don't know. It's hard to know because the strategies haven't completely been developed. But I, they do use the term to mitigate mm -hmm. displacement. So I think they acknowledge that some displacement happens. I think what they're focused on is involuntary displacement. And so um, the other thing I would mention is that communities that have done some work in this area that have developed strategies to, to mitigate um, involuntary displacement, there is an allowance to bring those strategies that you've used forward and, and get, um, in a sense, credit for it so that you've, you've already done some of that work. Uh, Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Again, Parker uh, uh, is against this, so we haven't met, but uh, I can only assume uh, we're still against it. Uh, to go a little bit high level, this this bill, again, just seems uh, to, it feels like it's a, a last ditch, meaning that they've, they've come to us, they've engaged us in conversation, and we've come in an impasse, so this is their path. This is their their idea of what right is. And uh, to me, I think what we're missing is we're missing that conversation uh, that we could have, that we are having, and that um, potentially funding in a couple of years or a year will, will, will give us. I think we all have the call to attention that uh, something needs to be discussed. I think we all are very nuanced in our different municipalities that uh, we have challenges and um, we all just got to get together and say, here's here's what Here's what our challenges are. I, I just do not think we can craft a good legislation through our, our narrative or our lobbyist uh, echoing our thoughts and concerns. I think it comes to thoughtful discussion to achieve a common goal and for us to try to um, avoid any major and material issues within our own municipalities. I think this can happen, but it will take a commitment uh, from us, which I think we have, uh, hearing from the narratives around the region, um, I would just reach out to the state and say, listen, give us give us the ability, the form to interact with you, to work through these issues so we can ultimately uh, find common ground and find good, uh, a good path forward to reach a positive conclusion. Dr. Levy. Yeah, thanks. And I realize I've spoken before, um, but I, I wanted to also speak to the displacement uh, potential and maybe Sheila can hopefully tell me that my um, perception is wrong. But um, this has been one of the major concerns I've had with this bill. Um, and, um, and, you know, it has been narrowed. And so the areas that are going to be most targeted for redevelopment will be key corridors and you know the the transit area, so that does narrow it. But I haven't spent a lot of time reviewing and under, trying to understand the anti-displacement provisions because the dynamic I think is going to happen is that people will be displaced; they will be priced out, um, and those the menu of options come into play after. Lower income people have already been displaced, and it might help some other different lower income people move back into the neighborhood. But it's it all of that 
appears to me to be very much after the fact. And I don't know whether that's accurate, but but I and and I also feel that, that it's a lot of tinkering around the edges when what will happen, what will cause displacement, you know, aside from outright, you know, bulldozing over people's houses, um, is those that that aren't driven out that way will see their property values rise and then their taxes and we're all dealing with sticker shock right now probably um and the bill cannot change that the bill can't offer property tax relief of any sort to try to help people stay there and is that is is my understanding correct in that regard that that it all of this if it happens at all comes into place after people have already been driven out of their neighborhoods Sheila? I can just share what I learned from people who are who work deeply um, on this issue is that addressing displacement and, and understanding it, that it needs to happen much earlier than when you're seeing that change in a neighborhood. And so just from a professional perspective, that that is what I've I've learned along the way. So um, I do think that there's comprehensive guidance in this bill about how to address or develop mitigation strategies, but the timing is is the key piece. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and and, and I guess for me, just a, a comment, you know, I I share Director Flynn's questions about the the ADUs and what that does because it 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 you've got to be a have you've got to have the money to be able to afford to create and build the ADU it increases the value of that property it conceivably creates another landlord and another tenant uh and and if that happens around you and you have not had the money to do that does your real estate value increase or does your value decrease where you are more vulnerable to somebody else coming in and and taking that property? I I don't think we know what this is going to do for real estate values in general. Uh, I do think that the, the, the state has made the assumption that greater uh, numbers, a, a greater inventory will naturally bring down the price. We there were some great people testifying yesterday that, that have worked in California, have worked in Oregon, and and basically said they didn't see that necessarily happening. I think a lot of us here are skeptical of 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 that increased inventory necessarily driving down costs and making things more affordable. Um, I think we simply don't know. Director Starker, uh, thank you, um, Steve. I had a I have sort of a question about if we. Uh, when would the when would these policies typically go into effect? And you know, I would assume that the development community is going to be sort of hanging back and not sort of pursuing a lot of uh, maybe aggressive strategy in the housing in the housing uh, market sector. Uh, you know, sort of pending some some real definition about what what the outcome of these uh, you know either potential litigation or these strategies need to go into play. When when do you think we would start being seeing some of this uh, sort of massive housing construction going on that will make the price more affordable? Assuming that we can, uh, you know, maybe address construction defects and some other some other issues. Doug or Sheila, Jen, any Andy, anyone? May have been a little too rhetorical. I'm, I I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, I was hoping it was a rhetorical question, Mayor. <laughs> I think your point was made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just didn't know if any of them had responses to, to that very good point. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. Staff, any issues you have questions on for the board? Or want feedback on? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sheila, I'm looking at you. I don't know if you have anything. To... I do oh, not. Is... I... Go ahead. Sorry. This is Sally. I had my hand up and I don't know what happened. Oh, haven't seen that. I apologize, Sally. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Sally Daigle Sheridan. Um, Director Daigle. And uh, I was wondering if uh, there's 
enough information to go ahead and give a technical marching orders uh, and go ahead with a, a motion. Do is that is that a possibility? Do we think we're there? Because I it feels to me or sounds to me like we're kind of all on the same page. Local control. Mm -hmm. Uh, answer these questions that we have regarding ADUs and this and that and the other. And uh, would, is that a feasible idea to entertain emotion? Let me ask Director. Because I'm ready to give that motion. <laughs> yeah, let's, let, let, if you don't mind, uh, let's have Director Rex comment first. Okay. No, Director Dangle, thank you very much for the consideration of this. I, I think as we did at the, the last meeting when we talked about this, that we we took the comments to heart and we used those in those conversations. And it was really um, Director Odorizio is the one that, that originally uh, proposed the idea of, you know, you know, giving us some flexibility, flexibility and latitude to work with um with with uh, governor's office and 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 staff on, on some of these amendments. I think we feel pretty comfortable where the board is on this stuff. Um, so I, I I don't think there there, were, there needs to be a motion, quite frankly, I'm not sure what that motion would be, unless there was something very specific that, that you wanted us to address. But I think we feel comfortable about where, where the board is. Okay, that's really all I needed to Thank know. You. you have my blessing. <laughs> Thank you, Director. March Lee. on. Thank you, thank you. Director Odoricio, and then Director Teal. Yeah, I just, I, I think that I was gonna weigh in to say that I think if we could continue to have staff just do the best we can to expand options, expand the exceptions like the safe harbor, meaning the menu, uh, you know, the menu of options that they're talking about uh, and flexibility wherever possible. What I mean by the exceptions like the 81, ADU one we talked about earlier, and then after we're done licking our wounds at the end of this process, it's, it probably behooves all of us to to convene this uh, fairly shortly and talk about implementation, um, and, and kind of own own the implementation as much as possible of whatever comes out of this. And if it goes back to the Senate version, let's all get together and figure out how to make that happen. If it stays with this um, the House version, let's get together and talk about how to figure it out and because if not and if we don't come up with ideas on how to implement then we're going to be further stuck with other people telling us how to do it so that's a discussion after three weeks from now but in the meantime uh, I, I think what i'm hearing from you is get as many of those flexibility options and exceptions as possible try to kill it in the senate if they don't get that what we want and then phase three would be figuring out how to make it work thanks guys thank you director teal Actually, I think Steve probably said it better than I would have. Uh, I think we need to maintain our opposition position and, um, yeah, keep doing what we've been doing. Um, that I think we felt like got a positive result from the Senate and, um, and uh, try to get the best bill that we can for the dead bill at uh, St. Bina. And I heard jazz in the background. I have this vision of Director Teal hanging out and listening to jazz to soothe the soul as we talk about SB 213. Director Wheel. What? What? Hey, look, hang on a second. What's wrong with that? First, it's me making fun of my cat. Nothing's wrong with that and at now all. I just, can't hang out with jazz. It just painted a great image for me. I, I thought it was <laughs> awesome. So very good. Uh, Director Wheel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm not quite as as prepared at this moment to shift gears and say let's just do whatever we get i th i think there's still opportunity for us to have some influence and and my my fundamental problem with this bill is that i think we have a problem that's real in in terms of affordable housing and some of the other things they touch on energy conservation greenhouse gas and the like i am not sure that we understand that problem in an operation, in a way we can operationalize a solution. Um, and I liked the Senate bill, which kind of admitted that, you know, we really don't quite know. So let's study it. Let's figure out what the problem is so that we have some comfort that the solutions that are proposed are going to be effective. Um, I, I think, I, I certainly do. And I, I 
get the sense that there's some skepticism that um, the solutions proposed will actually achieve the goal. The solutions proposed in the in the bill in its uh, expanded state will actually uh, uh, achieve the goals. And I also am concerned that there is a raft of unintended consequences that will come with that 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 aren't explored. If we really understood the problem well, I think we we and and I certainly uh, uh, resonate well with uh, I think it was Director Odoricio's point that you know a collaborative approach on this would have been a lot better from the outset. Um, and I think I think we've demonstrated, particularly Dr. Cog, that we can take complex problems at a regional level and solve them. And and the municipalities are not. Uh, uh, you know, violated or feeling uh, uh, bad about that about that method. Um, so I think there are models out there. Uh, they can stay, say that the, the the municipalities haven't uh, um, you know fixed the problem, and and you know one could say, well, yeah, and the state hasn't provided a whole lot of leadership. Now they've discovered this thing, and in three weeks we're going to fix it. Um, not not good problem solving methodology. So. I, I would certainly advocate that we try to get this back to the Senate bill where we're working to understand that problem more thoroughly and come up with solutions that we can be more confident will actually create progress. That's all I have, thanks. I think the Senate bill for some of us was optimistic because A, it, it took care of some of the problems that we had, but it felt like there was collaboration actually happening. It felt like some of the divisiveness and the we versus they was, was being minimized. And just from sitting in the, the chamber yesterday and listening to a lot of it, I think it's really unfortunate. This is an issue that so many of us agree on and it has created a we versus they, not just in terms of the bodies of government, but in the citizens that have been told it's government that's the problem, or it's part of government, but not the other part of government that's the problem. And, and I think one of the things we'll have to look at as we, as to quote Director Odoricio, look our wounds and move forward, is, is what do we do that, that works on this perception that has very, very cynically been created by proponents of this bill that local governments are bad? And, and, and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how we move forward from that. Ms. Lynch. Thank you, Chair Conklin. I just wanted to comment on a few things that were said. Um, I want to build on what Director Levy said about these discrete and, and tweaks that we can make along the way and just wanted to let you know that um, we've been taking notes along the way of all the different things that the board has said. And so as um, as Executive Director Rex said, we, we will certainly bring that back. But I just wanted to highlight that we we have been doing that along the way and we will continue to do that. And I wanted to give a plug for what may be a great opportunity at our board retreat on Saturday, May 13th. The legislative session will have ended and we'll at least know what the outcome was. And we will certainly ground our discussions in what has happened there and how it relates to the work that we want to do together moving forward. So um, just a plug. So show up on Saturday, May 13th. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will wrap up our conversation, I believe, unless yeah, anybody's got any final points, we'll wrap up the conversation on uh, 2.13. Uh, next up is just a note that our next meeting is May 17th. That is, of course, after the retreat. Uh, our intent, Mr. Rex, is on that meeting that will be- Oh, first. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, Tammy Maher raised her hand. Okay, Ms. Maher. I just had another matters and I just didn't want you to yeah, that's that's net that's net that's next that's next on the agenda <laughs> yeah, that's next on the agenda uh the the way the agenda is laid out we deal with the next meeting first and then we move forward to other matters by members so when this, we, just in case people didn't hear what, what was said so we're planning on, on the May 17th meeting um that meeting will be virtual we're, we're we're sensitive to the fact that you'll be downtown for a couple a couple days on the 12th and 13th and and uh, the executive committee decided to to treat that meeting as virtual. So um, obviously, we'll be sending out communication to that effect. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Thank you for the uh, 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 emphasis of that. And Director Maurer. 
Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that the city of Centennial is trying to address the problems of housing, you know, and uh, one of the thing is the construction defects law. And so we passed a resolution for uh, a reform of that. And then we've also went ahead and forward that on to our senators and to our representatives. And if anybody's interested, um, Doug was gonna put that in the chat if you'd like to see how we did ours. Um, so we're trying is, is, is our thing. We're trying to work out this problem. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other uh, matters from members? Okay, with that, uh, I will I will mention something that was in the chat briefly that Director Odoricio said, uh, that he said, uh, I lost the specific, but basically saying the best way to impact this is by one-on-one -on -one conversations with your legislators and the folks you have connections with. So continue using those and, and, and working on that. And, and thank you all for your, uh, your great thoughts and great feedback. Uh, with that, I will adjourn the, meeting, adjourn the meeting and we will see you hopefully all at the retreat. Thank you very much.